Okay, so that's our five main sensory systems. Now we're moving on to proprioception. And that is our position of our body in space. I like that picture of body in space, but that's not necessarily what we're talking about. <laughs> we're really talking about our own body, uh, knowing that I'm sitting in a chair, knowing that, that I'm reaching for an item, being able to control the amount of pressure I, I use in order to bring the bottle closer. So um, it's hard to get a picture of something that represents that. When we look at discrimination, we are looking at, these are the students that um, have a hard time uh, bringing their hand to their nose. So they're the ones that you they have to watch what they're typing on the keyboard. Um, they can't just type. They aren't learning by memory where things are. They have to be able to see it. Um, they are the ones struggling to use the trackpad because what they're what they're doing with their hand is not matching with what they're seeing on the screen. Uh, they're also the ones that are having a challenge with the mouse because the mouse is kind of the same thing as a trackpad. It's not really, they're struggling to control what they're doing over on the side versus what they're doing on the screen and it just doesn't match up. Um, when they're coloring, they can't color inside the lines even though that's a skill expected because they're struggling with that control. Um, and um, they're struggling taken in notes because they're trying to listen at the same time of processing and trying to write it all down. Um, so when we're looking at um, modulation over responsiveness, these are the kids that, again, are taking in so much information that they want to sit still. They want to avoid people touching. They need their space. They're kind of coordinated because they've got so much information coming in. When writing with a pencil or paper, it's so light because um, they can't modulate the pressure that they're putting down. They have poor posture um, and low energy because they're working so hard just to try to um, minimize the input that is coming in. And then when we look at under responsiveness, we look at the opposite. Um, these are the kids that are trying to get movement in as much as they can. So they're the ones that are bouncing off the wall or trying to move to get that input in. Um, they don't know their own strength. So they're instead of closing the door, they're slamming the door. Instead of closing their um, Chromebook, they're slamming their Chromebook. Instead of pushing their chair in, they're um, shoving their chair. They don't know their own strength because they can't modulate um, they can't modulate their bodies in order to be able to interpret the input that is um, that they have. Uh, they enjoy lots of movements, swinging and jumping and running. Um, they have high energy. They tend to be chewing on the clothes in the objects because, again, they're looking for oral input as well as movement into their bodies, into their joints, into their muscles. Um, and they tend to hide um, because they're, ha they're, they're seeking out that. Uh, that input, so they, um, hiding tends to be both modulation under and over, truthfully. <laughs> it tends to be more over, but. Okay, so the next system we're talking about is the vestibular system, which provides that information about movement and the balance of the body. And with discrimination, we're looking at they have poor balance and they seem kind of disorientated in space. They have a real hard time perceiving the motion. I um, have to, we have to stop for a minute. I love that picture because it's also where their head is in space. <laughs> and that's why she's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. So, um, so if that's okay. So they might have an odd posture or they're clumsy. So they're they're holding their devices, you know, the teacher says, okay, we're going to the library and we're supposed to bring our iPads. So they're holding their iPads and they're bumping into walls and they're crashing things. And the teacher's saying, be careful, use two hands. They're the people. If they were to fall or trip, they wouldn't even know like, which, which hand am I putting out? Am I putting on my left side? Am I putting on my right side? I'm not even sure which way I'm falling. Those are the kids with the discrimination problem. 
With the over-responsive vestibular system, you find some sedentary kids. So they tend to avoid activities that have movement and they worry about falling, even if there's no risk of it. These are the kids that are sitting working and the teacher says, okay, pair up. And their table mate scoots a chair over and they're like, oh, oh no, because they, they came close, like pushing their chair into them. Or if the teacher says, oh, scoot your chair in a little bit so so-and-so can get through and helps push their chair in, they could startle. They can be over-responsive to all of that movement. Now, the under-responsive vestibular system is exactly the opposite. So, so they're the ones who are using all of the alternative seating in the classrooms. They're the ones on the wobble stools, on the therapy balls, on the glider rockers, they're in the cushions, they're in the office chair spinning in a circle. They love movement and they can never get enough of it. So we have to definitely build some movement breaks in for them. So uh, we're looking at seating systems. Now, when we look at vestibular and proprioception, any over or over under responsiveness, proprioception strategies are going to be good for that. Um, so that we're looking at calming activities. We're looking at seating options. We're looking at um, being able to move for some of our students um, or altering different positions. So a floor, a floor option is excellent because they can lay on their tummy. They get very good shoulder stability. Um, and if you think about it, all of our kids are using technology all the time. And where are they using it? On that flopped on the couch, <laughs> over an oversized chair. Um, so giving some of those options are great benefits for them to still be able to focus as long as they um, are focusing without having to um, attend to what their body needs. The other thing we want to look at is providing those options regarding movement breaks. Um, movement breaks, you can use Go Noodle for the full classroom. You can use Yo-Yo uh, or um, the Cosmic Kid Yoga is great on Go Noodle. Um, you can do it for the full classroom. You can do it individualized for students um, so they can go for a walk if they need it. Um, as OTs, when we look at proprioception and vestibule, we might be offering other options, like we might be offering pushing and pulling and deep pressure activities. We might be offering weighted vests or weighted blankets to keep, get that deep input. Uh, we might be providing more movement activities like yoga and animal actions and tug of war and Simon Says. We might be really getting that input through um, trampolines and running, getting that really deep input. Um, but that's going to be more directed for OT intervention. So um, as teachers in the classroom, they're going to be looking at what can I do in order to provide that break for them short term in order to refocus them. Um, seems like there was something else I wanted to add on there, but I'm going to move forward. <laughs> I forgot that we had the olfactory and the gustatory intermixed here. Um, olfactory is just our sense of smell. Gustatory is our sense of taste. This does not tend to impact our kids as much, usually during technology. Um, but we did want to make sure that you're at least aware of it and understand it. So in discrimination, these olfactory smell and taste really go hand in hand. Um, so when we talk about these, we kind of talk about them together. Discrimination is being able to identify an odor, but not really where it's coming from, or not really being able to identify what that odor is. Um, it's usually um, usually something that they know um, they know that's familiar, but they're not always the smells or taste can be distorted. Um, Okay, so modulation. Modulation. So for hypersensitivity, hyper we just wanted to quickly tell you 
Um, for oral motor hypersensitivity, they're, they gag or choke if they're eating, they're picky eaters, they won't try new foods. And smell over responsiveness might be the kids who gag from certain smells or avoids foods because of the smells or avoids public places because of the different smells. Moving on to hyposensitivity. I'm flying through these slides, but there'll be a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> hyposensitivity, they're the ones that are always mouthing things and they're the ones that are chewing on things. So you're gonna find them chewing on their clothes, on their pencil, on their charger cords. Um, they might chew on their fingers or bite themselves. Under responsive smells are, they enjoy those really strong smells or they smell things, people, devices, things that you shouldn't smell, they're smelling. Um, and then they don't notice those dangerous smells. I want to talk about those strategies for taste and smell because the sense, so due to COVID, we have had to have breakfasts and lunches in our classrooms. And that does impact our students with technology and that does impact the students who have different smell and taste systems. So you need to be cognizant of the students who are sensitive to smells and odors during instruction. I also want you to think about how your classrooms might smell after recess or gym class or in middle and high school, how they're experimenting with those perfumes and colognes and deodorants. So all of those things that you wouldn't necessarily think were preventing your student from working with technology might be preventing your student from working with technology if all they can think about is, oh my gosh, my head hurts, my eyes are watering because of that smell, or oh my gosh, you smell good and I wanna come <laughs> close and smell you. Um, as far as the taste goes, those are the students, you know, instead of chewing on their chargers or their pencils or themselves, you can have them try gum or different types of snacks, um, like the dried apples. So there's different dried fruits. There's like raisins, there's pretzel sticks, there's carrot sticks. Water bottles is something we've really, really started pushing in the school systems. Our drinking fountains are closed down. You can refill your water bottles at them, but our kids haven't been able to get a drink at a drinking fountain in ages. So we've really pushed out drinking from water bottles. And those water bottles that have that flip top and it's like a built-in straw. So sucking is incredibly regulating. It takes us right back to infancy and that sucking motion can regulate and calm kids down. Cold water is alerting, warm water is regulating, just so you know that. And none of our kids are ever hydrated enough. And hydration, you need to keep them hydrated to keep their energy level up, to keep them engaged cognitively with their academic tasks. The last sensory system is that interception. And that is really the sense of our body's internal state. It's how we feel, how we understand what's happening. It's that autonomic response system of blinking and breathing and flinching, but also it regulates our emotions. It regulates um, our, our internal sense, okay? So it's through muscles, it's through organs, it's through joints, it's through bone, it's our whole body really understanding what is going on internally. Um, okay, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, the interceptive system impacts all of these physi physiological needs, safety needs, belongings, and really the strategies are making sure these are covered. It's providing water, providing food, providing the sense of what they need in order to feel like they can learn. And you know that self-actualization is at the top where you really need, that's where you're learning. So all of those base foundations need to be um, completed before they're able to learn. Okay, and we, we wouldn't be really very good OTs at all if we didn't talk about structure and routine and how important it is with our students. So not only guided access on the iPad, boy, is that just the best thing in the whole world or what? Guided access, two thumbs up. Um, it keeps them on, it's in accessibilities. You turn it on, you enter the code, 
It's a triple click on the home button and then it keeps them on that page. So for our students who are constantly visually trying to get information or go off task, that keeps them on their, on their page they're supposed to be on. There's all sorts of different timers that you can use. There's visual timers, there's auditory timers, and that helps with the kids um, not only understanding the concept of how long they have to work on it, but also that there's an end point to their day. Because so many times we forget as adults that kids come into the classroom and they might not understand the concept of time. So they don't know when it's gonna end. So giving them those timers helps. Visual schedules and lanyards help and video modeling help. So here on this slide, I just gave you a couple examples. Oops, one back. Kathy, <laughs> of, of writing with a uh, explain everything app. That's a checklist for my students to use. And then there's a voice to text checklist. I just wanted to give you two different examples because when we give them these supports of visual schedules and visuals and video modeling, we increase our students' independence. And that really is our goal. And then the last slide is just the resources and the references that we've put for you guys. And you can click on those links and they will take you to the correct location. Mm -hmm.